Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. If this is your first time joining us, uh, big shout out and welcome. We're all about bringing science, exploration, adventure, and conservation live into classrooms across North America and beyond. So if you head over to exploringbytheseat.com, uh, you can find all the events that we have coming up, and we'll be announcing our May event shortly. Any given month, we could be hosting 40, 50, even 60 live events uh, for classrooms like yours to tune into live or afterwards. We've got a great event uh, in store for today. I'm really excited to have Debbie Eanson joining us today. She is a seagoing oceanographer and a numerical moder or modeler. So she combines expedition work with powerful models to predict how the carbon and oxygen cycles will uh, continue to change due to climate change. So just like on land, uh, those same cycles are happening in our oceans. So she's a federal research scientist with the Institute of Ocean Sciences in Sydney, British Columbia. She's also an adjunct professor at the University of British Columbia, Simon Fraser University, uh, and the University of Victoria. So I do want to give a quick shout out to all the groups I can see tuning in live via YouTube. It's great to have uh, you there. Please use that chat for introducing yourselves and then keep it free for questions. We don't wanna to have to mute anybody today, but I am gonna bring Debbie in now with us. Debbie joining us live. Hey, Debbie, how you doing today? I'm doing pretty well, thanks, Joe. I'm, I'm already feeling uh, like I have a lot to live up to after the introduction. <laughs> ah, fair enough, fair enough. Well, I have no doubt that you'll be able to deliver. Uh, we're thrilled to have you joining us today. Like I said, a great crew joining in, both live on camera with us. We'll meet some of those groups later. Uh, and then of course on YouTube, but for now, I'm gonna let you take over for a bit. Great, you can pop the slides on. All right, here we go. Oh, and I think Debbie, you just have to, to click them again. We can see the StreamYard screen. Okay, got it. Excellent. Perfect. See it now? Yep, okay. we got it. So I'm not sure if you think about the ocean as breathing. I don't know how you think about the ocean, but by the end of this talk, I want you to recognize that it's absolutely immense, covers most of our planet, and it breathes. Okay, so Joe already told you I'm an oceanographer. Um, does that mean I get to go out on ships into a rough ocean and have adventures? It absolutely does. I'm very, very lucky that way. Um, in fact, I took this photograph when we were just deciding if we were going to send this big instrument down into the bottom of the sea here, which is over a kilometer deep. Um, and what, how this works is on the way back up, all these bottles are open when we put them down and we can talk to them with the, the electrical cable, the, the cable you see attaching them and tell those bottles to close at different depths on the way up. So in that way we can get water right from the bottom and all different depths of the ocean. And then we make all kinds of measurements on that water. Okay, it's not, I just, I don't want you to think that my job is all going out and having Jacques Cousteau adventures. I do sit at the computer and crunch numbers and write papers like this one um, quite a lot. And these days I sit around looking at a computer screen with um, headphones a lot too, but I'm thankful for it. And I'm really thankful to get to talk to you today. So how did I get there? Just a brief moment about my career when I was, uh, how it started when I was a little younger than you. Um, I was in Ontario. I was very far from the ocean. Um, and maybe more important, I was not a great student. So what happened? I had some really, really amazing teachers. And I just want to say, I, I mean, I hope that you've had great teachers all the way through, but I didn't. So if, you know, just really appreciate those great teachers. It's huge. Um, and be curious. If, if there are things you're interested in, pursue them. And a little stubbornness goes a long way too. If you have some ideas, don't let anyone tell you that, that they're not worth it. You know, not all ideas work out, but, but give them a go. Okay, on to the science. What do we need to live? I mean, survive. So now at this point, Joe, I want everyone to be able to shout out. You tell me what we need to live. All right, so uh, we do have some classes uh, that are virtual with us. So in the chat, you can shout things out into the chat. Uh, okay. bar, and then I can click on a few teachers as well. And if they have anything coming in from their students, uh, we can steal some of those. So that'd be great. Uh, 
I can already see things coming in from his heart's group, water, oxygen, Jeff, uh, Mr. Carr's group, shelter, oxygen, food. If I look at the comments coming in, food, water. I love it. I yeah. love it. So you guys, water, food. I mean, I tried to give you those tips, but you also told me shelter and air. And not only, but I heard oxygen and I love it because I, I oxygen is the key, right? When we breathe in air, we're not just getting oxygen. Most of what we're getting is in fact nitrogen. If you look up at this pie up here, but the oxygen, the blue stuff, there's a whole lot of it. And it's plenty to do our business as long as we're healthy. And oxygen is what I wanna focus on here. And why is that? Okay, if you think about food, you may feel like right now you need something to eat right now, but really you can go days without eating yourself, okay? But your cells on the other hand, they need food all the time. And to get the energy from food, they need oxygen. So you need oxygen all the time, basically every minute. And these brain cells are a great example, right? These brain cells are what, what are running our whole body and telling us to live. So oxygen is really special that way. Now I'm gonna go on and look at where I study in the ocean, fish and other marine organisms like the, the brittle stars. I don't know if you can see them, but you squint in there, those little, those little kind of feathery looking guys and soft corals too, they all need oxygen, all right? Now let's think a bit about this fish. I want you to think for a minute and, and think about where do you think it is? Maybe what kind of a fish, but most of all, I want you to think, how old is this fish? Okay, I, I want you to just take a guess. I don't expect you to know, but how old do you think this fish is? Okay, so just take a moment, have a number in your head. All right, we'll see what starts coming in live via the chat. I can also start clicking on a few of our educators and they can tell us uh, okay. what they think is coming in. So let's, let's get started here. All right, Ms. Hart, if you wanna, give an example there. I see that you've got one up in there. Uh, who else can we bring in here? Mr. Carr, what does your group think? We're thinking two years old. All right, I'm gonna jump to another group here. I like this one that just came in from Laurel School of Princeton. What do you guys think? We said 70. <laughs> All right, let's check out YouTube. I've got 100 years, 50 years, 20, 35, 120, 1,000. So look. Lots of different wow. guests coming in. You guys, okay, I'm impressed. You've spanned it, all right? These fish, maybe not this particular buddy, but, but some of his colleagues can live to be 200 years or more old. So some of you were, you know, guessing young years and some of you were more in the ballpark, like crazy old. So this, this fellow could have been 100 years old already when your great grandma was born, which is just amazing, right? Some of these fish have been alive longer than Mm, we've been making engines and really, really changing the way our planet, well, the climate in our planet. Okay, the fish happens to be a rock fish, which means it likes to be right along the bottom. And this is 400 meters deep. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to think about 400 meters and just remind yourself that if you were running around the track, it would be about that distance. And then just try to imagine, could you swim down that deep and I hope if you think about it, you realize there's no way you could because even a diver with oxygen tanks, um, even a Navy SEAL diver can't make it anywhere near that deep, okay? And then I'm gonna just say, this is how we got the photographs of that fish um, with this contraption that we made at home, which is so part of, part of my job is getting to work with fun engineers. Um, and this is a video camera. So that was a still of a video. And this video camera can go kilometers beneath the ocean. And this is work that we've been doing for, for a few years now. Question is, is there a lot of oxygen down there in the ocean? Um, and I'm not gonna ask you to, to, I'm just gonna tell you the answer this time um, by showing you the only graph I'm gonna show you. I, I want you to imagine that you're looking in the side of an aquarium here, okay? And this is the surface at the top, all right? The part that's dark and you're going all the way down to the abyss, three kilometers at the bottom, and you can see where Mr. Rockfish lives at like 400 to 500 meters, okay? And then the aquarium water is colored by oxygen. So at the very top, there is lots. This dark color means lots, and as you get down into the, the white, it means hardly any, or in other words, not enough, okay? 
So I hope what you can imagine from this, this picture is that the water gets, the, the deep ocean gets its oxygen from the surface. And in part, that's from the air, okay? The, the, the oxygen in the air that we breathe is dissolving into the ocean water. And in part, it's from little tiny plants that are in the surface of the ocean. And they're only in the surface where they make oxygen because that's where the light is. It's really dark in the abyss. Now, how does, oops, should have stopped here. I hope when you look at this picture, you have a bit of a question in your head, okay? Because it's a lot whiter, a lot less oxygen in the middle than it is in the bottom. There's some color in the bottom. Now, why, why might that be? And that's because the ocean here isn't getting its oxygen from right above. It's a little bit like our brain getting oxygen. We don't, our brain doesn't get oxygen from the shortest distance from like our scalp, like going right through our skull. We have to breathe the oxygen in and it flows all the way around our body in our blood. Now the, the ocean is, is kind of the same way. And there are only two real places in the world where the ocean does that deep breathing, where the surface water can mix all the way down to the bottom, bringing oxygen. And they're where these blue stars are. So if you live around Newfoundland or Antarctica, which I don't think you do, those are the places in the ocean where you get oxygen top to bottom. Everywhere else in the ocean, you're either, if you're away from the surface, you're depending on, I'm gonna think of it like a train. You can see the picture of the train there. You're depending on this water to flow from these stations where the train is full of fresh oxygen. It's like the train hasn't left the station, it's clean. The bathrooms are still nice. And it needs to then flow all the way around the ocean until it gets to all these other places. And it happens to be where the rockfish lives, which is where the train picture is. That's where all this is going on. It's kind of, the train's been out for a long time. It's kind of the end of the line. The bathroom's not very nice and there's not much oxygen. Okay, so here we are kind of running out of oxygen, not that close to those, those sites where, you know, a real deep breath. <gasps> breathing all the way down to your toes. That's what the ocean is doing. And now if we, there's one more part about this picture I want you to think about, and that is the time. So these happen to be snapshots in time. We've been going out in ships all this time. So the beginning here where you see these, these boys, this is, this is when kids used to dress like this. It's 1960s. And at the end, on, on the right side, it's now. So it's a little bit subtle, but if you look at it in the middle where, where all this white is, you can see that they're white botches, but there's still a little bit of color. I hope your computer screens show it. And as you go on in time, it gets whiter and whiter. Not only that, this band is actually getting wider. And it's doing so, you know, pretty quick. Because if you think about that rockfish, if I put, made this graph where the rockfish were born, the rockfish would be like way off to the left at its birthday, right? So this is actually happening fast. The ocean is changing the way that it breathes. Now, if we found out that we were having less and less oxygen in our air, I think we'd be panicking, right? We'd wanna know why. So I'm gonna try to tell you one of the biggest reasons why, and there are more reasons, and I hope you ask me lots of questions. This is one of the biggest ones. So think about going swimming on a nice, warm, calm day. And I hope that all of you have had a chance to do that. Then if you were gonna dive beneath the water, like go deeper, say, to try to tickle the toes of a friend or surprise someone or just have a look on the bottom. Have, have any of you done that? Is it, when you go down, is the water colder or warmer? Now I'm gonna ask you to shout it out again or type on YouTube or whatever. Colder or water when you go down deep? Colder or warmer, sorry. Let's see what starts coming in here. Uh, I'm getting colder from Miss Stanley's class, colder from Laurel School, colder, colder. Everyone's saying yeah. colder. You know it, that's right. Because that warm water sits on top. And is that warm water or cold water? Which one is heavier, warm or cold? That's a, shout that one out too. Which one's heavier, more dense? All right, let's see what starts coming in here. The colder, the colder, everyone's saying yeah. the colder water. You know it, okay, great. So 
if I take the warm water, which is lighter, and I warm it up even more, what's going to happen to this scale? Okay. I think you guys can see this. The colder is going to be, the cold water is going to be even heavier. The scale is going to tip even more. Now, one more shout out. What are we doing with climate change? Is the air, the air that we is on the surface of the earth, is it getting warmer or colder? Shout it out. All right, Mr. Carr's class is warmer, Ms. Stanley, Mr. Shattuck, everyone's saying warmer. Yeah, you guys, you guys know it, and that's good. Okay, so the air is getting warmer. That means that the ocean is absorbing some of that heat, right? The water on the surface is getting warmer too. And if we think about this in a timeline again, back when in the 60s, when kids dressed like, like they are there on the left, we had just warm water over cold. It, it took some work to turn it over to do that breathing, okay? But now we have even lighter water over that cold, which means that it takes a lot more work to mix. It's harder for the ocean to breathe, in other words. And I have this, this cartoon here. Mixing takes energy, right? It's like, you can think of it like pushing a rock up the hill. And so in the past, it was hard with the warmer over the cold, okay? But now it's even harder, which means that the ocean is breathing shallower. It's more like, like we're hyperventilating, okay? And this is really where I'm, I'm, I'm gonna leave you. We've, we've seen this, that the rockfish isn't getting an, as much oxygen as it used to, nor the corals or the brittle stars. And, and will they be getting enough? Uh, I know this is a dark place to leave and it's not very hopeful, but I actually think that the hope here is that we, we, recognize, we recognize the impact of our own actions. And I, I believe in all of you young people that you're gonna be much more clever and help us find ways to live so that we stop impacting the environment and we allow the other organisms to share with us. So that's the end of my slides. Now it's time for you to ask some questions, please. All right, excellent. Well, I'm gonna come back in, Debbie. We'll pop the slides out there. All right, well, thanks for that great presentation. I, uh, you know, I know you do spend a lot of time, uh, you know, as a scientist in front of the computer and that's important work as well, but I think your other office is pretty cool too. So thanks for taking us uh, uh, to see that other office. And, you know, I think there's a lot of students tuning in today who might be surprised that, you know, the ocean does breathe and that we do need to have that that oxygen cycling. And uh, it is a big deal what we're seeing happen now. So thanks for for bringing that to, to our attention today. All right. My pleasure. We've got a great group joining us live. So those on YouTube, now's the time. If you want to start sending in some questions uh, via the chat, we'll work some of those in. I'm also going to start visiting some of our camera crews. We have... I think we have a couple of classrooms who are still in the classroom, but uh, most of our classrooms are joining us uh, virtually today. So let's see, let's go to Mr. Shaddock's crew. So they're joining us in Chalk River, Ontario, grade six, seven, eight class. How are we doing today, Mr. Shaddock? Doing well, thank you, Joe. Um, Debbie, a question for you. As you're seeing that these fish are getting less and less oxygen, are you seeing an impact on either their, their behavior or their breeding cycles? Or, or what are you noticing that's changing in the fish? So first of all, I, I didn't stress this, but this, this camera setup that we have to go deep, it's pretty unique. And what it means is that we're seeing things in organisms that many of them have never been identified before. It's, it's very much, it's almost like going to a different planet. Um, so what that means is that it hasn't been very long that we've known that some of these organisms exist. Now the fish are different. The fish um, live kind of, I didn't, didn't mention this, but it was a sea mount that it's on, an under, underwater mountain. And, and people have known that they've been there for a while, because not because they've seen them in, in a video footage, which allows you to see more about how they're behaving, et cetera, um, but because they've been captured in nets, which, which, and, and heavily fished, in fact, not, not uh, just, which is a bit tragic when you think about their age. Um, what, so I can't talk about their behavior or their breeding, because I don't know. Um, but what I can say is there are several seamounts that, were visited back in 2017, um, where, you know, and, and then again in 2019. And 
what has been recognized is there's several seamounts where there used to be rockfish and there aren't anymore. Um, so it looks like, you know, we'd have to go down with the camera many times to see that there was actually, there were actually no fish on these mountains, but it looks like some of them have already disappeared. Um, and it may not be only because of the oxygen, but honestly, if they, if they have less oxygen to breathe and they, they need to be on the bottom, there's no doubt that's creating a lot of stress for them. Okay. And I think that's a great uh, point that you brought up that working uh, and monitoring the deep sea is not easy. Um, no. You know, you have to be there, you have to get out there, um, put the gear into the water. Um, so, you know, right now, a lot of the work too is probably gathering a baseline, just kind of figuring out how things are looking and then so that we can continue to monitor uh, in the future. That's exactly true. All right. And so this brings a good question from YouTube talking about the gear and, and you know, just how difficult it is. Uh, we saw that 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 camera gear look like maybe it was an, was that an ROV or just kind of a leave at the bottom kind of stationary gear? It's an ROV. Yeah, okay. remotely operated vehicle. That's right. All right. And then so the question has come up a few times is 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 what happens if if that gear breaks down? Has it ever broken down while while doing what it's doing? <laughs> yeah. Um, but in this case, it's attached. Okay. So we so we can we can pull it. Um, it's being driven from from above, but then uh, we we've never lost an ROV on the seamount, or at least not to my knowledge, not that one. I think that ROVs have been lost before and never recovered, um, and then they end up like garbage on the bottom of the ocean, which is very sad. And there there are lots of um, I mean I don't know how if you've had many other people talking about the ocean, but there are other um, little devices that are put out that um, measure things in the ocean and they pop back all on their own and they pop back to the surface and they transmit to satellite. And at the end of the day, when they die, they, they end up on the bottom of the ocean, which isn't something I feel great about, but we get a lot of information and about oxygen from them. Okay, and yeah, I was on a, an expedition once off the coast of California and an ROV, ROV was about three kilometers down. And as it was being retrieved, uh, there was a pinch in the fiber optic cable. So totally lost power uh, and everything. It was retrieved, but then the whole thing had to be unspooled back on land, find and remove the, the pinch. So yeah, there's lots to think about with that kind of gear. There really is. Okay, let's grab another live group here. Let's go to Mrs. Stanley's crew, fourth and fifth graders joining us in Ontario. Let's bring Miss Stanley in. How are we doing, Miss Stanley? Great, thank you so much for your presentation, Debbie. Um, my students were wondering, specifically um, my student named Joey, he's wondering, um, do different oceans have different salt concentrations and does yes. the salt affect their breathing? Yes, excellent question. I didn't, I didn't, uh, wasn't sure how much information to give. I didn't want everyone to go to sleep and so on. So I'm really pleased that someone asked about salt, um, especially in our ocean here, the amount of salt is what really controls that heavy light, that mixing piece. And, and in fact, the Pacific Ocean where we are, the surface is a lot less salty than the Atlantic Ocean, um, which is part of the reason why that Atlantic Ocean by Newfoundland is, is an area that um, can breathe deeply. And the water cycle, of course, is changing with climate change as well. So um, certain things that happen, like the formation of sea ice. So if you imagine, um, how they salt the roads in the spring. The roads are, um, they put salt, or in the winter, they put salt on the roads because um, it's harder to freeze water that's salty. And the same thing is true in the ocean. So when sea ice is formed, it's actually re rejecting some of the saltiness. So you get a lot of ice formed, you get a lot more salt beside the ice all of a sudden. And that water is even saltier, which makes it even heavier which helps this whole breathing cycle. So as we are um, forming less sea ice, we're also changing the way that the ocean breathes. Is, and, and there's all kinds of um, different, different places where, where even um, the ocean doesn't have to breathe all the way to the bottom, um, but where this, the, the formation of ice is just hugely important into that, in that piece. So the Atlantic is way saltier than the Pacific. So great question. All right, good stuff. We love those questions. Keep them coming. 
Uh, I'm gonna grab another quick one off of YouTube here. Where did, oh, uh, Charlie is wondering, uh, how many places have you visited on expedition? Mm. Well, I don't even I don't even know that answer. I have um, I can say that I've I've spent almost a year of my life at sea, which isn't that much compared to some oceanographers. Um, I've worked in Texas. I've worked in the UK. Um, I've I've met cruises that have arrived in South America, but not um, in Montevideo, um, but not actually been on those cruises. So. Um, you know, quite a few places, but maybe not as many as I, I'll admit my husband has been, he's also an oceanographer, has been uh, just every every continent in the world, except Africa, in his case, um, and, uh, and in most ocean basins. So yeah, I, I mostly stick to where it's cold though. <laughs> All right, fair enough. We've got Mr. Carter class joining us. They are in Calgary, Alberta. Uh, let's bring Mr. Carr in to represent his class. How are we doing today? I'm doing great, thanks. Uh, our class uh, has two questions. Uh, the first one is Canada hasn't come close to meeting any of its climate change goals in the last 30 years. How do we get that to change? And secondly, uh, we had recently done a research project and we had looked at three of the threats facing the oceans. Number one is uh, climate change, second was overfishing, and the third was just pollution. In your opinion, are, is anyone much more important than the other? Gosh, you've just asked like, so, you know, between the both questions, you're really covering a lot of ground and really important ground. Um, I'll try to start with the first question about um, Canada and how we meet our goals. Um, and don't let me go, go off track and forget any of these pieces. That's something that I really, really don't know. And as I'm getting myself older and I have kids, um, I'm thinking more and more about and less about like getting in and doing the fun little bits of science. Well, I still think about that because I don't know that answer. And, and that's something that I'm, I'm kind of hoping all of you young people are, are gonna really be thinking about because it's a really, really, really hard question. You're talking about, in large part, changing the way people think. And, and part of the reason that single nations don't meet their targets is because they think like, if I sacrifice all my economics and all of these things, like I don't think my neighbor is gonna do it. So it's a trust piece, right? So why should I, make these changes that are gonna cost me money when I don't think buddy across the road is gonna do it. So, you know, it's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of pieces in there to, to make, get people to trust each other and, um, and really understand that it's time, that it's time to make a change. I think I really admire Greta, Greta Thornburg. And I think that, um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to see more people who are who are really able to say, hey, we've got a problem and we need to change. So so that's my my non answer, I guess, to the first one is like we've all got to think about this. Um, now, getting on to the second question, which I think was about three threats to the ocean. And, and you talked about climate change, pollution and overfishing, I believe. Um, and which are the greatest threats? It's a hard one, uh, and I think some of them operate on, I'm gonna say different time scales and space scales, because in some places, smaller places and for shorter times, pollution is, uh, is gonna be number one for some communities, there's no doubt about that. And we can even look at the CO2, and I, haven't, I didn't talk about carbon today, the chemistry for carbon is way more complex, um, but it is is pro my primary research focus. So if you you think of the CO2 that's coming out of our exhaust pipes, et cetera, um, that has been viewed already as a pollutant, okay? When it's dissolved in the ocean, it makes the ocean more acidic. And, and there was a, a case in the US um, uh, uh, where the, a Supreme Court law case where the Environmental Protection Agency was sued um, for, for letting the coast uh, be polluted in this way, right? Um, and where they used some of our, some of the data that we've collected. In fact, some of the data that we collected on the very first slide I showed where in, on that ship 
um, to argue that that uh, that that this pollution was already occurring. So there's no doubt that pollution is important uh, and it is a is a huge problem. Climate change is 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 probably our bigger problem over over a long time scale. Um, but if we're thinking about Mr. Rockfish down there, the overfishing is just key. And what, one thing that appeals to me about thinking about overfishing is I actually feel like there's a hopeful piece when we think about fishing and mining. Deep sea mining is a new thing on the table, uh, a horror, I might add. Um, but we can actually control that. We, we can say, hey, we, we can have zones, marine protected areas where we don't fish. Um, so we can protect enough animals that can spawn, et cetera. So I, I feel like fishing is something that's a little bit where we have, we have some control. And that, that's maybe not a great answer, but that's my, my first take. Please ask follow-ups if I didn't cover the right things. All right, excellent. We're gonna take another little trip here. We're gonna go to New Jersey uh, to see some fourth and sixth graders. I'm gonna pop them into the call here. There they are. How are we doing, New Jersey? I'm trying not to get in front of some of my students. Here we go. Oh, we're great. Thank you. Can you hear us? Yeah, we yeah. got you. Nice and clear. Perfect. Well, I'm sorry. Do you have a question? You want us to ask you a question? Yeah. We were wondering, I mean, I think you've talked about, uh, well, we were wondering besides the uh, issue of oxygen um, not mixing as well and therefore not kind of helping the ocean to clean and restore itself, are there other impacts of climate change on the ocean um, that we should be thinking about? And then the other question is, what can we do to help as people? And, and so you've sort of touched on some of those things in your last answer, um, creating the limits on where we fish and where we do things. But if there are other ways that we can help, especially you know, as students and parts of our family, just as regular citizens, that would be awesome to hear. So thank you so much also to both of you. This has been great. Okay. Um, so the first uh, question, other ways that climate change has been affecting the ocean, um, I talked about a little bit too. So, so the ocean is in general, there's less oxygen. So we talked about that in the talk, but then with, with respect to carbon, as we make more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the ocean is taking up, like the ocean is taking up the heat. It's also taking up the carbon dioxide, uh, and and that issue is called ocean acidification. So that's also a huge, um, that's also a huge piece. So um, organisms, why do we care if, if there's more carbon? The ocean becomes more acidic. Um, without getting into the the chemistry too much, like for the carbon carbon dioxide to get in there, it has to get involved with the water, and you end up with more. Um, H plus ions floating around. And that, that really changes the way a lot of um, animals can do business. In particular, um, creatures like the corals that I showed, but also oysters, anything in the, in the, near the surface ocean has a, a much harder time, takes more energy to build their shells, their shells and their skeletons, their hard parts, um, when they're made of, of, of carbonates. So um, ocean acidification is a huge one. Um, deoxygenation and to some degree um, this whole business about um, the sea ice okay so if we if we have more ice melting in general um, and ice flowing from the land and water warming it, uh, it you know the warm water you all knew that it was lighter but as it gets warmer um, and less dense, we have sea level rise, okay? So I think in New Jersey, you're, you're gonna be really aware of that, probably even with storm surge events. So, so the sea level is, is, is getting higher and that will have a huge impact on people who live near the coast. Um, now, we were also talking about what we could do uh, for climate change. And, and that's another one where I think personally, the biggest thing that we can do is is think about how we can change our life our life cycles our lifestyles so that we need to burn less carbon um, make a lesser impact 
And that's a big, big problem. And it's also one that I, I think about a lot. Um, you know, I don't travel that much, it, it, not just because of COVID. Before COVID, being a climate change scientist, I would limit my um, my flights. I would only make one round trip flight a year. So I didn't stop it entirely because it's an important important part of our job to, to talk to each other and talk to people like you. Um, but I tried to limit it because I calculated how what my personal carbon footprint was. And I realized that it didn't matter that I rode my bicycle to school or grocery shop or any of that. I could drive a big old SUV. What really mattered is that I was flying around the planet. So um, think about, just to really think about those things and what your, your personal um, footprint is. That, that's probably the first thing. And then, and then there are bigger problems that I'm not the one to ask. How do you change the way people behave or, or the way they, they think about their neighbors, whether their neighbors are human or, or animal? And I don't know that answer. All right. Good stuff. We're getting some great questions coming in today. Yeah. I want to great. to, yeah, well, this is the good thing is it's on students' minds. And I think that's really important because, you know, the sometimes the, I think students think they have to wait till they're adults to make a difference or mm -hmm. uh, to join clubs or write letters or, um, you know, start their own organizations. But I think we're seeing more and more examples around the world where uh, students are starting to stand up and use their voices to, to make some change happen. Uh, we're going to take a trip to a virtual grade six school here in Ontario with their teacher, Miss Wilson, but she is out today. So we have their principal hanging out with us today. So that's pretty cool. Let's bring them in live. How are we doing today? Hi there, we are doing great, thank you. We've got all kinds of questions in the chat, but a number of students are really interested in the career uh, of an oceanographer and are asking questions um, like, how did somebody, my, oh my how did somebody yeah, find out that um, the ocean had oxygen or that the ocean breathed? And what is the rarest fish that you've ever seen? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and and how long have the people been day, oceanographers? Great Just questions. Um, and and some this is part of what I love about my job. I don't know the answer to all questions. Um, so I think that one could argue there have been oceanographers for for uh, hundreds of years, depending on how you define an oceanographer. Um, but some of the earliest. Uh, what people that we call oceanographers were were some of the Scandinavians and who really noticed some important things about you know the way the wind blows. Um, icebergs don't go the way the wind blows; they go a little different way because the currents. I mean, the people who were there were a lot of seafaring people, and they wanted they wanted to understand the ocean currents. So it's been a long time that people have been thinking about the ocean, in particular. I'm going to say it's it's physics, um, which is which is in fact thinking about the career of an oceanographer. That's how I started. I, I studied physics as my, my first um, degree. And that, that way I'm going to say, um, when it comes to the fish, I know that um, marine creatures, I'm deeply interested in them myself, but they're not my specialty. So the weirdest, rarest fish I've seen, oh, I don't know. I'd, I'd really want to um, encourage Joe to get some of my biologist colleagues in. I do think about um, the marine creatures not just because they're interesting, but they're the motivation for why or, or the living creatures on land and the ocean are the motivation for, for me in large part for why I study what I do, which is more the physics and the chemistry. Um, so I don't have a good answer for the fish, but I will say that um, one of the coolest things that we saw on the video cameras that my colleagues have shown me are these... Um, these amazing glass sponges. They're like glass, and this, so they're animals too. They eat particles from the water, um, but they're, they're you know, way taller than I am. And sometimes they sit in these, these literal forests where they're like, they're like glass carvings really. Um, so I'm gonna say that that's my number one cool thing. And, um, and there's even pictures of them in the, in the paper that, uh, in the first slides, that there's a paper that we, published last summer. Um, so that's pretty neat. Now, I'm not sure if I answered everything. So you have to tell me if I missed something. I think there was a first part that might have been missed or did yeah. you do pretty good. How did we learn that the ocean breathes? 
good. Um, yeah, how did we learn that the ocean breathes? Deep water formation. I think the first first places that people would have really, um, I guess, number one would be that that um, instrument that funny contraption with the bottles, not the cool video camera, but the contraption with the bottles is stuff. That's something that, you know, I think for, for roughly 150 years. Um, and if some of my colleagues are listening, they're shaking their head, I got it wrong, but I think that's about right. 150 years, we've been lowering instruments like that down. And we didn't used to have, be able to make those bottles close with an electric current. We used to throw a rock down a line. So a big, big weight that would go <coughs> cause the bottles to close. And I've actually used a lot of those bottles in like near shore work myself where I didn't have all that fancy stuff and um, that they work really well. And so I think that back at that point, um, people were able to, to start to measure things like oxygen through it's a titration. So I don't know um, how many classes have had chemistry classes where they, you know, they take a solution and they add acid to it till it turns a color maybe or reaches, you know, some, some reactions happen. That's all, um, it's like a, it's an acid base thing, but it's something that um, it's a more tractable way to measure things. It's in fact much harder to measure carbon in the ocean than oxygen. So we have, we, we have been measuring oxygen for a while. And I think that understanding that, first of all, being able to measure the temperature and the salt in the water that was down deep and seeing that, oh my gosh, it's, it's, it's pretty close to what the surface is all of a sudden, or things are, are similar all the way down. I think that people started to understand about how, how the ocean was breathing and maybe didn't put those words into it, which in fact are my own in that case, um, probably at least a century ago. Um, thinking about the way, because it takes like that train trip I described, it takes like a thousand years really for the water to kind of cycle through the whole ocean. It's a long time. So I think the biggest surprise about some of the changes that we're seeing now in this water that's been away from those sites for a long time is, is how rapidly they're occurring. Okay, another great series of questions. Uh, we have one more class to visit, uh, one more live group. Ms. Hart's group joining us, grade sixes in Ontario. Let's pop. Uh, Miss Hart in. How you doing, Miss Hart? Good. How are you? Good. Good. Um, we had some questions um, just about global warming um, and what are some things you notice. Is there more areas that you notice global warming than others? Mm. Okay. So I I, uh, I guess hot spots, things where places where things are changing even faster. Um, and the Arctic is, is one of the number ones, both the Antarctic and the Arctic are places where we're seeing changes that are extremely rapid. Um, and depending on, on what quantities you're interested in, I mean, people tend to live quite, I mean, the, the coastal ocean is where people live, right? We don't live out, out in the middle of the ocean. So there are lots of places um, that are like more protected fjords, inlets or bays, where a lot of people live, where they're seeing huge impacts of um, climate change that are that are accelerated or or made worse by the fact that um, I guess pollution, local pollution, is a way to put it. But say um, crops that use fertilizers, when the fertilizers run into the ocean, um, they can cause even more ocean plants to to grow, um, which doesn't seem like it would be such a bad thing. Those plants are making oxygen. But, but in those cases where um, you don't have a lot of mechanical mixing um, and things, the oxygen's ending up going into the air in that case, the ocean's making oxygen for us. And when those plants sink down and die, they're really using up all the oxygen that, that's down below and that isn't getting replenished. So, um, and, and, and you may have all seen things where there, there's, a, there's a headline about, oh, a massive, um, uh, fish kill it can be in the Great Lakes too, or or the off the coast of Oregon. And I think 2008, there were crabs and fit, everyone drifting in dead from um, an event where, uh, um, as I said, you, you we all these creatures need oxygen all the time. They can't take a break from it, and so so where some water flowed in with no oxygen, and and they came came to the shore. I think that's the best I can do for that. <laughs> okay, no good stuff. Um, as we, you know, we prepare to wrap up the call for today, Debbie, I know 
you know, we, we, we've kind of left at a spot where we still have lots of work to do, uh, lots of research to do. So there are lots of careers, uh, you know, exploring our ocean, studying our ocean. I mean, we've got better maps of the moon and Mars than we do of, of the yeah, sea. Yeah, that's true. Some of those seamounts, they, they um, went out last year and said, oh my gosh, we thought the peak was this deep, but it's really actually much shallower. <laughs> she didn't even know. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Yeah, alert to do. So I hope some students out there are thinking about careers uh, in oceanography, ocean exploration. And then, you know, one thing I learned from spending some time on a, on a ship doing deep sea research is you don't have to be a scientist. They needed navigators and crew members and ROV pilots and, uh, you know, people cooking the food on board of the ship. There's tons of science communicators who can spread the word. So tons of different jobs as well available in ocean exploration. And lots of jobs that are to answer those questions that the students just asked. I think that how do we how do we how do we change this? I I, I yeah. really 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 look forward to all of you making this better. Well, one thing I've learned from hosting a lot of you know great ocean scientists and explorers around the world is that our ocean is resilient. If we give it time, if we give it space, uh, it can bounce back. And we've seen lots of examples of that with things like marine protected areas. So uh, I think there is some hope. I think you're right. It's a matter of finding out how do we get those messages um, out and how do we get everybody on board. All right. Well, I want to give a huge shout out to YouTube. Thank you so much to, we had a very active crew on YouTube today sending in some great questions. I want to shout out to our camera classrooms uh, from different places, Ontario, Alberta, uh, even New Jersey. And Debbie, thank you so much. I, you know, I love the way that you kind of broke everything down and made a complicated issue uh, easy to understand with examples uh, for the students today. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Well, a reminder to everybody, check out exploringbytheseat.com. We have lots of events coming up. Your classrooms can join. Uh, for now, we are going to sign off for today. So thanks, everyone. <laughs>